Throughout countless generations cultures have romanticized the lost civilization of Atlantis, the lost world of leaders and great minds that was brought to its knees from its own greed. It has served as both a cautionary tale and a source of awe and wonder for the intellectually curious. How did the land that was Atlantis come to be? And what can be taken from the tale of a race that was once proud and mighty before being brought to humility by the gods of ancient Greece? What was Atlantis? According to legend, the ancient gods and goddesses divided all the land in the world among each other. Poseidon was given the island of Atlantis, which was actually the size of a continent. Atlantis was said to be larger than Libya and Asia Minor combined, making it a respectable piece of land to inherit. Poseidon was pleased with his allotted land. He fell in love with a woman who lived on the island named Plato. They were married and had five sets of twins together, all sons. The oldest son, Atlas, was given rule over all the island, which was also named for him. In addition to being king of the island, he was also named king of the sea. This is how the Atlantic Ocean received its name. Though he technically had control over the entire island, he chose to make the mountain where he was born and the surrounding land his home. Atlas twin, Gadarius, was also given considerable inheritance. It is said that he was given control over the area of Atlantis that was closest to the Pillars of Hercules. The four other pairs of twins were also known to be very prosperous. They were all known to have impressive land and many subjects. The names were Amphas, Evimon, Nasius, Autochthon, Elisippus, Mester, Asis, and Diopreps. In addition to ensuring his son's great wealth, Poseidon also built a great city for his love, Plato. He carved the mountain where she lived into a great palace and placed three moats around it, each moat larger than the last. The moats were approximately one to three stadia wide and were separated by rings of land that were just as expansive. Bridges were constructed leading into the island and tunnels were carved into the moats to allow the passage of boats in and out of the main city. Each moat was heavily guarded to ensure the protection of Plato and her sons. The island itself was also rich with resources. No one had to toil in order to survive. All work was relatively easy and made for high quality of life. Every food grew in their soil and the animals were plentiful enough for all who lived there. The land was also rich in precious metals like gold and silver. Additionally, Poseidon himself had made a stream of hot water and a stream of cold water that ran through the island to ensure that all the needs of the people were taken care of. What happened to the paradise land? It seemed as though the future of Atlantis was incredibly bright and prosperous. However, as the years went on problems began to arise. Atlantis was still the culturally rich and immensely wealthy island country that it started as, but greed began to arise in the hearts of the people. This greed is often said to have come when the gods began to intermarry with the humans living on the island. It is possible that the sudden exposure of increased wealth and power bestowed on these humans made them hunger for more than what they needed. This greed caused them to look past their own country and seek to conquer other lands. They started with the area inside, the Pillars of Hercules and sought to control all the land in the Mediterranean. Country after country began to fall to the power of the Atlanteans until only one power stood against them, ancient Athens. By some miracle, Athens was able to defeat the superior Atlanteans and the conquerors from Atlantis were forced to return home in defeat. This is not the end of the story, however. Zeus had become angered by the actions of the Atlanteans and their attempts to conquer lands far beyond their own. 
Because of this, he sent a series of earthquakes so great that Atlantis was sunk into the sea over the course of one day and one night. Was Atlantis an allegory or actuality? The legend of Atlantis has been one of the most intriguing and inspirational tales that continues to captivate modern society. This is actually quite interesting considering that Atlantis itself was not of any significance to Plato's body of works. There are many questions that continue to cause great interest in the case of Atlantis. The most intriguing, perhaps, is whether the story has any historical accuracy whatsoever. There are many different perspectives when it comes to arguing the case for Atlantis. While most, but not all, people believe that Atlantis is a tale that has been wildly embellished, it remains unclear as to what percentage of the story is fiction. Was Atlantis really inspired by a world that was stolen away by the ocean? Is it conceivable to think that such an advanced civilization could disappear so suddenly without leaving any trace of their culture behind? And if Atlantis was simply an allegory used to convey a message, what information can be taken from the story? To fully understand the confusion that comes with the tale of Atlantis, it is necessary to examine the texts and the author. Plato and Atlantis Plato is well known for his many philosophical works such as The Republic, but curiously enough the story of Atlantis was not meant to be one of his more prominent works. The tale is embedded in Critias and Timaeus. Other than these two pieces, no reference of Atlantis can be found in his writing. Interestingly enough, however, there is at least one work that is known to have referenced Atlantis before Plato recorded the story in Critias. Plato supposedly quotes Solon, who is said to have traveled to Egypt between 590 BC and 580 BC while there, he supposedly came across the Egyptian records of Atlantis and translated them. It was through these records that he discovered the story of Atlantis. This story was supposedly passed on from Solon and eventually Critias became aware of the legend. It is Critias' character who narrates the story of Atlantis in Plato's dialogues. Critias explains that 9,000 years before the story he recites was told, Atlantis went to war with the surrounding countries in order to expand their territory and show their might and superiority. Alliances were made, but one by one every power fell until there was only one left, ancient Athens. Coincidentally, the ancient Athens that is described in this story has a suspicious amount of similarities to the ideal society that was described by Plato in The Republic. Because of this, many people wonder if Plato may have fabricated the tale of Atlantis in order to use the story to demonstrate how his idea of a perfect society was correct. Contradicting theories. In Plato's time, it was widely accepted that Atlantis was an allegorical work that was used to express Plato's vision for an ideal society. There were many works that were thought to be inspired by Plato's use of allegories, especially by the Renaissance writers. Some works thought to be inspired by his methods are New Atlantis by Francis Bacon and Utopia by Thomas More. These works stayed within a similar allegorical model and used this structure to prove their point. However, in the 19th century, more and more people began to associate Atlantis with a real place that had been lost or destroyed. While they didn't believe the entirety of Plato's tale, they were of the opinion that there was some truth to the story of Atlantis, the only question was what had been exaggerated or fabricated, and what could be used as a clue to discover the identity of Atlantis.